there. Just delighted to be able to address this virtual polyglot conference, global polyglot conference. I think it's a wonderful initiative, uh, kind of gathering together virtually people all over the world who are interested in languages, interested for themselves, interested for others, people who share the view that learning languages is one of the most rewarding things that we can do. It's it kind of opens the door to exploring the world that we live in and we also think it's good for us and uh, there are no downsides. So I'm happy to be able to participate and what I want to talk about today is something that has, I wouldn't say it has bothered me, but it's something that I've often thought about whenever I have attended one of these polyglot conferences and that is, you know, we are all enthusiastic about language learning and uh, you know we might be five or six hundred at a particular conference in Reykjavik or in in Bratislava or in Montreal and we're all excited but what are we doing to kind of spread the word to the thousands if not millions of people who have at one time or another felt that they would like to learn a language uh, they don't know quite how to go about it or they've had perhaps a less than satisfactory experience at school or elsewhere and here we are patting ourselves on the back how great we are that we can speak speak two or three or four languages are we helping these other people uh, do we at our conferences just by using the word polyglot um, perhaps discourage people who say, well, I kind of know one and a half languages. Do I qualify? Can I go there? And we want to say, you know, come along. We want you to, you know, get your feet wet and get immersed and learn more and more languages. So that's what I want to deal with today. How we can work with the, the broader world community in spreading an interest in languages, helping people learn languages, you know, widely spoken languages, less widely spoken languages, you name it. So my first point really is, is that, that the, the teacher of a language is the language itself. So we need access to language content. That more than any specific instruction about the nuts and bolts of the language. Very often until we've had enough exposure to the language, experience with the language, a lot of these explanations about the language aren't very meaningful to us because we don't know what they're talking about. You have to have a, a, an ability to, to, to experience, to taste the language, to experience certain things which cause you to think about why do they do it that way or how does this work and, and when you have that degree of curiosity then you are receptive to explanations about how the language works. Until you have that exposure, uh, a lot of these explanations and what's often worse than the explanations is some expectation either on the part of the teacher or on the part of the learner, some expectation that somehow we're going to get it right and we're going to remember and we're going to produce the language uh, correctly or accurately. It's quite unrealistic until you have enough experience with the language. The language is the great teacher. So the issue becomes how do we get people you know, exposed to the language, enjoying the language, to develop that curiosity about the language, to develop some sense of the language without having necessarily to sit down in a traditional language learning environment. Well I think uh, as many of you who have heard me before, I'm a great believer in comprehensible input compelling input. But of course when we start in the language nothing is comprehensible and if it's not comprehensible it's not very compelling. We are compelled by the desire initially to learn the language so that is in a way compelling. Of course it's not comprehensible at all but there are things we can do. So one of the things is these point of view stories. I believe language learning starts with stories rather than disjointed phrases or words. So the story is initially not comprehensible, but by listening and reading repetitively, we start to get a bit of a, you know, toehold in the language. And so the, the stories, if we listen to them over and over again, if we read them over and over again, gradually we get a sense of the language without knowing 
all the niceties, all the details of how the language works. It can be useful to get a bit of a heads up, uh, but very often these issues about whether the language is subject, verb, object, or subject, object, verb will become evident to us as we get into the language. And once we've ha ex had some experience then with that, these explanations may help us to notice some of the things that we experienced. So in that regard, if we look at the, the language world that surrounds us today with the internet, we can access all kinds of content, but initially it's not comprehensible, therefore not very compelling. We know that out there waiting for us are movies on YouTube, on Netflix, all of which can, or for that matter, podcasts, and I'm, get, I'm going to get into that, which are potential sources of compelling input. And so that as we're struggling in the beginning, we know that we can look forward to an unlimited range of language experience that is going to help us learn. The other thing we can also rely on is people. So here within our polyglot community, we have people who speak a variety of languages. All of us are in a position to create interesting content which can help other people learn. So that is sort of the language environment that exists today, which is so different from what existed 50 years ago when, for example, I was studying Chinese. So, and, and I think one thing that I want to encourage people to think about is how we can create compelling and comprehensible input for others, particularly around stories. And you know what we have done at Link, for example, we created these 60 mini stories which we wrote up in English and then translated into over 30 languages. But the instructions were to write these using the most frequently used verbs in the language. And they repeat five times within the story because the story is told in one tense and then in another tense or another person. And then there are what we call circling questions. So a statement comes out of the story, a question about that statement, and then the answer. And all of these are given. No one is required to rack their brain to remember what was in the story. And the net effect of all of this is to give you, you know, relatively high frequency verbs repeated five times within the same story. And then of course, by reading, and then especially by listening to these stories over and over again, you gain that initial breakthrough into some degree of comprehensible input. So a very good example is these many stories, as I said, here's an example in Spanish, but we, these exist in all languages. And these are, have been my introduction to Greek to, to, uh, because I didn't have these before, but since I started into Greek and into Persian and into, uh, uh Arabic, this is how I have broken into the language, moving then eventually from there into, you know, more difficult and perhaps more compelling content. But these stories, the people who have worked with us to create these stories, they have just used their smartphone to record. And this is sufficiently high quality. There's no need to over edit. Okay. Now there is a bit of a problem in that these stories, we have them written out. So people just record them, but the opportunity is to create many, many more of these stories following a similar format. And of course, the more natural the stories, the better. So often the problem is transcribing these. So I will get into that. The, um, you know, if I look at say in, in Persian, uh, we have had, uh, I have been in touch with two people in, in Iran who have created stories. Not only have they translated our stories into Persian, but they have continued along the same line creating, you know, narratives around people, Iranians, how they lead their lives, what they do. And each one of these is followed by these circular questions, circling questions. So anyone can do this. We can do this in all the different languages. And I will explain later on that we are involved in a project to do this for Nahuatl, since next year we will all meet in Cholula, which is of course uh, an important uh, indigenous language uh, in the area of Puebla in, in, in Mexico. Uh, but the opportunity is like one of the conditions for adding a language to link is that these 60 mini stories all be translated and recorded. 
Uh, and on that basis, we have people working on Maori right now, for example, and a whole bunch of other languages that will be added. But, you know, it's not just these circling questions that are out there in the, in the vast sort of internet world of content. We have, you know, Netflix, we have uh, podcasts. Po podcasts are huge. I rely to a large extent in my Persian and Arabic and Turkish learning on podcasts. And you can find podcasts, Google, you know, first of all, there are different websites that, that give you the variety of podcasts that are available, particularly for English, but for every language and on every conceivable subject, there is an abundance of podcasts um, to suit your interest. Uh, there are apps for podcasts. I happen to have chosen Pocket Cast as the podcast app that I use. Uh, now, of course, if I listen to a podcast in Arabic, chances are I won't understand more than 20% of it, or at least I will understand maybe 30-40% of the words, but it's not meaning yet because I'm not strong enough. So I have to be able to read what, you know, get a transcript of that podcast. And for the longest time, I had to, and I did this for Greek and I did it for Korean, I had to pay someone to transcribe them. And if this podcast doesn't give us permission at link to share this in our library, I'm essentially paying it for myself, which is quite expensive. I think it's a good investment. I think it's as good an investment as investing in a one-on-one -on -one with a tutor. I mean, you can't get away from it. You have to, in many cases, pay people to help you. However, what has now happened, and of course, I'll you know give you an example how in, in my Arabic uh, learning, uh, I have a lot of podcasts that I use for my learning every day. But, and so there are a lot of podcasts for Arabic. And, and, and I don't think that, that Arabic is, is necessarily a language where there are more podcasts than in other languages. They're in all languages. The difficulty is the transcription. So some years ago, I used several automatic transcription services and they weren't very good. And particularly for someone who is learning the language, if 10 or 15 or 20% of the words don't make sense, and if there's no adequate punctuation, it's very difficult to use these transcripts to help you understand the podcast. But recently, I discovered that one of these automatic transcription services has significantly improved. And I want to make everyone here aware of that, people who are listening to podcasts, which I heartily recommend. Uh, and just to digress, you know, the advantage of a podcast is you're just listening. So you can download a podcast, you go off in your car, in your train, you go out and do things, or you're working around the home, you're listening to stuff. The Obviously we can import, like at Link, you, we have a browser extension, you can import from Netflix, you can in, import from, from uh, YouTube, but you have to watch it. But this way, you can just listen while you're doing other things. However, when you listen, you discover that there's just a lot that you don't understand. So then there's a, a tremendous desire to see it. Now, Happy Transcribe, Happy Scribe rather, which I've now started using again, is tremendously accurate because I had been using someone, a person uh, in Morocco to help transcribe my Al Jazeera podcast, but it was just getting too expensive. So I tried Happy Scribe again and then I compared the result to a transcript from my uh, transcriber, the person doing the transcripts in Morocco, and the accuracy was like 99%. So I said, okay, from now on, I will switch to Happy Scribe. And as you can see from the list of transcripts here, uh, I am using their service, and that gives me podcasts to listen to during the day, and then a text that I can read. I can bring the whole thing into link, audio and text, and I can study this as compelling comprehensible input. It becomes comprehensible because I have the transcript. Now, um, you know, these exist in all languages. The, the one thing to bear in mind, once you move from your, you know, initial period with the mini stories where you're into, you know, high frequency vocabulary, as we move into the more authentic vocabulary, such as the podcasts, and even more so in podcasts than in, say, movies, is that there is a lot of relatively low frequency vocabulary. And there's one thing that, that uh, you may or may not be aware of, and that is that 
regardless of the content or the genre or the language, frequency declines very, very quickly. So that, let's say in the mini stories, you're meeting the same words over and over and over again because these are relatively high frequency uh, words and verbs and even structures. As you move along into the more sort of authentic and potentially more, you know, interesting, compelling input, verb uh, frequency is declining very fast. So you end up having that sense that you're not really progressing very much. You're acquiring new vocabulary much more slowly, but a lot of this low frequency vocabulary is very important in order to understand subjects of interest and eventually in order to be able to, you know, have conversations about subjects of interest in order to sort of elevate your game to, uh, you know, a level of genuine fluency so that you can understand newscasts, podcasts, movies, and engage with people on a wide variety of subjects. So this declining frequency uh, is, a, is just a fact of life and you're going to learn the first thousand words relatively quickly and it's going to take a long time to achieve, you know, that say, call it going from A2 or B1 all the way up to B2. I consider that to be a long, long road. And so it's so important then to have content of interest so that you are enjoying exploring the language and exploring subjects of interest. So I'm able to listen to podcasts in Arabic about, uh, you know, whether Sudan should participate in the normalization of relations with Israel the way Bahrain and, and the Emirates have done and what are the internal considerations and all of this in Arabic. So it's fun, even as I struggle to understand uh, when listening and even while reading and saving words and phrases on my iPad, I'm struggling, but I am, you know, it's compelling. I'm, I'm pulled into it and I, and I gain a totally different understanding of that part of the world. Similarly in, in uh, Persian, where uh, Sahra, who is our collaborator in Iran, has created a whole series on the history of Iran, on, uh, you know, ethnic groups in Iran, uh, Iranian food, uh, the Iranian, you know, different writing systems in Iran. All of this is very compelling. And so the interest in the subject matter keeps me going because it does take a long time to achieve that next level, call it that B2 level. It's a long road. And if I look at my own experience with Arabic, let's say, I started it, you know, over two years ago and it's been off and on because I've, I've traveled with my wife, I've, we've been different places. I've also had, you know, bouts of Turkish and, and Persian interspersed with my Arabic. But now, uh, I am engaged in a 90-day challenge at Link, and so the last little period, I've seen a big spurt, and uh, basically I've added about 2,400 known words to my known words total at Link just in the past month, and I intend to continue doing that. Now, what we're doing at Link is obviously the podcasts are out there for everyone. You have to find your own transcription service. You have to find your own podcast. Uh, the different podcasters have conditions uh, that they place on the use of their material. So in many cases, we can just import those for our own use at Link. However, any material that we create ourselves at Link is available for everyone, free download. Uh, all of our many stories are available free for free download. If you want to use the Link functionality, the ability to import, uh, you know, whatever, YouTube videos and stuff, that's a different story. But if you just want to take from our repository for you know more than 30 languages of audio and text material go at it now as part of that we are working with anya in puebla to develop material in nahuatl so i can't tell you exactly today where that stands but it is our intention to introduce that as well into our library at link uh, people can use all of Link's functionality to work on Nahuatl or they can just help themselves and download free of charge this content once we have it, once we have it put up. Nahuatl is an interesting example because we don't have any indigenous languages, although in fact, you know, what's an indigenous language? If there's a million and a half people who speak Nahuatl, uh, there's four million people who speak Finnish. There's maybe a million and a half people who speak 
Latvian, a language is a language, whether it's spoken by a billion people or by a million people or by 500,000 people, it's a language, equally valid, valuable, interesting, worthwhile learning. The issue is how can we create content in these different languages, both at that sort of beginner level with lots of repetition to help people get into the language, and then later on, what kinds of resources are available podcasts or books or audiobooks or movies or you know Netflix series and so that whole you know language environment how much of that is there how much can we create both for the beginner group and then advise people let people know of what's out there let people know about things like happy scribe uh, different podcasts, to what extent can we share this information, share our skills, share our energy to help more people get involved in learning languages and enjoying learning languages. And so that's what I want to leave you with. And of course, the other thing I want to leave you with is next year in Cholula. We talked about Nahuatl for a reason, because next year in Cholula and maybe Anya and Richard have some plans to, I don't know, encourage us to learn Nahuatl before we show up in Cholula, and maybe I will do that. And uh, in any case, uh, I am very pleased to participate in this virtual or global polyglot conference, and I look forward to the next face-to-face -face meeting in Cholula. And I also apologize for giving this entirely in English, but I think that way we're assured that everyone can understand it. Uh, but if there's any demand for me to provide a similar presentation in one of the other languages that I speak, I'm certainly open to that idea. Bye for now and good luck to everyone. And stay safe. <laughs>